be running for what office at whatever time uh, don't really matter. Yeah, I, thank you for having me. I, I think to suggest that these charges are political is, is somewhat preposterous. If you read these indictments and you're at all familiar with the American justice system, um, you know, Trump famously said when he announced his candidacy or shortly after he announced his candidacy back in 2016 that he could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and get away with it. And I think that's, you know, metaphorically what we're seeing play out here as a former federal prosecutor that's tried uh, more uh, criminal cases than I can count. I can tell you that the the indictments here and the evidence alleged is absolutely overwhelming. I wish I had uh, anywhere near this much evidence in the criminal cases that I tried. And that's not just my perspective, that's the perspective on these cases from Republicans that served in his administration. I think it was uh, Attorney General Bill Barr, a Trump appointee who served as his attorney general in the last administration. Uh, upon reading the uh, the indictment in the um, uh, the other case with the um, the, the, the records uh, the espionage uh, act case called uh, you know Trump toast uh, I, I, others have said there's not only a smoking gun here but a smoking arsenal it's just an absolutely staggering amount of evidence in both cases whether it's uh, with direct witness testimony uh, his own statements being audio recorded uh, video surveillance, it goes on and on. So, Look, so Adam, the law wasn't just created. The laws that he's charged with weren't just created in the past year or two. These laws have been around for a very long time. Adam, and the facts that give rise to these charges were created by Trump. So, yeah. you know, okay. you've got existing laws, criminal laws, and you've got criminal conduct by Trump. You put the two together and that gets you indicted. And that's what's gone okay. on here. And the but, but Adam, Adam, how, do, how does the American justice system rise above all of this, this political mud throwing that's going on and the accusations against it that it is being politically weaponized? Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I, you cut out a little bit, but I think I heard the question. Look, it's incumbent upon the Department of Justice and the prosecutors to proceed apace without regard to the politics of, of the day. Uh, and that's what they're doing. So you're going to have the political partisans make what they want to make uh, about these charges. The Republicans are going to defend Trump and the Democrats are going to use them against Trump. And that's just, you know, that's just the way of the world. What Jack Smith and his team in the Department of Justice have to do is proceed without regard, without fear or favor uh, with respect to Trump's uh, uh, presidential campaign and, and just proceed as they would in any other case. Uh, and that's what I believe they're doing. Uh, Adolfo, what, what do you make of, of what you heard just there? These charges are absolutely yeah. not politically motivated. Right. Let me unpack a lot of what both guests said. First of all, Rena, independent judiciary. No one's talking about judiciary. We're talking about prosecutors, uh, and they have discretion. And they're political uh, individuals. With the professor should note that every one of these has been either a Democrat appointee or an elected Democrat that's bringing these, these prosecutions. Um, this indictment is absolutely ridiculous uh, on its face. It is the January 6th report with some omissions, and I'll tell you the important omissions that were made. It is a sh you chilling attack on the First Amendment. Does we have an independent you, judiciary? A, it, I don't know why it, we need to... It, 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 there's a difference between... Uh, Arena, yeah, let me finish. Yes. Yeah. There's I, a difference between the judiciary and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, and the, 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 you check me, oh, and okay. you're, you're trying to discredit what I said about an independent judiciary. We have an independent judiciary in this country. It's supporters of Trump like you that keep saying, that's a Democrat, that's a Republican, that's a Democrat, that's a Republican. Why? Did I, did I, did Read I, the Constitution. Did I interrupt the other guest? Did I interrupt Don't the other guest? Don't name-check me. Okay, okay, Don't look. Check me. Okay, I'll, I'll, Adolfo, I'll, I'll Adolfo, Adolfo check make, make your point. I'll fact-check you. Make, the fact is, read the Constitution. We have an independent judiciary. Don't try to bring this, your alternative. Uh, okay, look, either we, we this person has a monologue, or I'm allowed to finish. We can't, we can't yeah, all he, talk. He always about, does this. He always names well, that. We cannot have, like we cannot have two people with my. Listen, you continue. You continue. You continue. You continue your. You continue your program without me. Do not fact check me. You continue your program without me. Stop. You continue your program without me. We can't talk over each other, and Adolfo has, has gone. Okay, well, uh, well, well, Rena, just, just make your point quickly, and we'll go back to Adam. 
always brings up people's partisan strikes when he talks about the judiciary. You'll see that that's a trend the Republicans are going towards. But in our Constitution, in our guiding documents, we have an independent judiciary in this country. And you see, this is a reflection of how Americans have lost trust in our institutions. And this is something that happened very rapidly under Trump. It didn't start with Trump, but it's something he has really benefited from. And I think Judge Eileen Cannon in Florida, who had Trump's other case, she wasn't as... as uh, let me put it this way, defamed as hard as this next judge that's going to be assigned this indictment case, this third indictment, because this is now an Obama-appointed judge. So you'll see Republicans bring this up over and over, and it's really hard for the country because we are, again, we have an independent judiciary in this country. Adam, could Trump face jail time if convicted on any of these charges? You're going to have to explain to, to those of us who, who aren't familiar with the the way that uh, the American uh, justice system works, the way that the political system works, can he still campaign or take office if he's a criminal defendant? Is there a precedent here or are we in uncharted territory? And what happens if he's convicted but wins or, or wins and is then convicted? Yeah, look, there's nothing in the Constitution that prevents somebody... Uh, under indictment, somebody on trial, or even somebody convicted from running for and holding office in this country. The only thing that would prevent Donald Trump from taking office or remaining in office would be if he was impeached by the Congress. Uh, so, you know, I think Trump's legal strategy here, because he knows and his attorneys know that the evidence is overwhelming, uh, is so his legal defense strategy is to be elected president and, and uh, um, uh, uh, you know either either himself or and pardon himself excuse me um, or you know hopefully uh, in his mind a, a, a Republican that's um, you know favorable to him will get elected and, and pardon him like Ford did with Nixon but his defense strategy at this point is exclusively win the presidency and pardon himself because barring that in all likelihood, he would be convicted based on the evidence in these cases. Okay, and if he is convicted, all of all of the, the the charges that he faces, he could face prison time, but but he could also just be fined instead of any. But but how would you put a former president in prison? Look, you know, no one's above the law. That's you know one of the bedrock principles in this country. Uh, you, you hear a lot about these charges, and they talk about statutory maximum prison terms. Those are kind of, you know, do not exceed numbers in reality. Um, they're not really how, how sentences are fashioned. Sentences are fashioned by what are called the United States Sentencing Guidelines. They kind of inform the judge of, of the appropriate sentence based on a whole host of factors uh, about the, the, the case and the defendant's background. And then on top of that, the judges have a, a pretty broad degree of discretion in fashioning an appropriate sentence. They can't exceed what the statutory maximum sentences are under the under the uh, the criminal laws that the that the defendant's convicted of, and in this case, you know they're consecutive, and and when you add them up, you know you're talking you know tens of decades of years. But again, that's not how the defendant sentence. It's going to be under the guidelines and the discretion of the judge. But when you look at the cases here, the crimes that he's charged with and the conduct that he's uh, alleged to have committed. In all likelihood, if he is convicted of either of these two cases, he will be sentenced to some term of imprisonment. Uh, that's, you know, it would be extraordinary if he wasn't, and it would probably be very appealable by the government if, uh, if he wasn't sentenced to a term of imprisonment. How has he done it? How, how, do, how do you sentence a former president to prison, to answer your question, just like you sentence any other defendant? Rena, you heard us talking to our White House correspondent uh, way back at the beginning of the program, and she was making the point that you have your diehard Republicans, you have your, 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 your dyed-in-the-wool uh, Democrats. But it is uh, the moderate and independent voters who are, who are going to decide the next presidential election. I mean, if it is a Trump-Biden rematch, they're not faced with much of a choice, are they? I mean, what are they going to do? 
Well, uh, we like to think we have a multi-party system here, but truly we have a two-party system. And so people do choose the major party when it comes time to elect a president and they get behind it. But more and more Americans are feeling like these parties don't represent them. Uh, look at our congressional uh, approval ratings. They continue to go down year after year. We even feel like our elected representatives sitting in Congress don't represent us. So partisan stripes aside, uh, a Biden-Trump rematch really signals one thing for the country is that we are in truly uncharted territory. To have octogenarians serving in the White House when the retirement age from coast to coast in the country is anywhere between 61 to 67 is just, I, I believe, nonsensical. Uh, I'm an advocate of term limits, but again, I'm also a really big believer in, in following the Constitution. I don't believe in ele abolishing the Electoral College. I believe our founding fathers didn't think we would have leaders this old, but it's where we are. So it's incumbent upon the parties to do better. And I see the RNC uh, doing something unique this time. The RNC chair, Ronna McDaniel, has introduced a pledge. She's introduced criteria um, in, in the form of money or polls and, and certain polls. You have to pull at a certain percent. She doesn't want these vanity candidacies to become uh, really part and parcel with how we do politics, particularly from the Republican side today. So I think that's quite unique. On the Democratic side, you see Biden's the guy, but who's one heartbeat away from the presidency, and that's Kamala Harris. She still has record high levels of disapproval. There are many Americans who are very nervous about a Harris presidency. Again, a heartbeat away. So I think what we'll see leading up to next year, if Biden and Trump are on the ballot, you will see Americans vote against one or the other. Adam, we, we thought that, uh, that January 6th was, uh, was uh, an incredibly dangerous moment uh, for the, the U.S. Things don't seem to have got much, much better since then, even though they are a little calmer. How dangerous a moment is this for U.S. democracy, do you think? Very dangerous moment. We're living in, in you know, very dangerous times today. And in particular, uh, you know, given the kind of reactionary tribalism on, on both sides, but, but, you know, you see this with Trump supporters as, you know, as core base day after day. It's like facts just don't get through, right? There is a point of view about what is going on in this country and about this indictment that is, it's just immutable. Um, and if Trump is convicted and if they believe, you know, those, if they're not persuaded by evidence that is presented at a trial and it, it doesn't look like anything would persuade them. And if he, so if he's convicted and you're going to have a lot of angry people and, you know, a good chunk of these people have already shown a proclivity towards violence. So I think that, uh, you know, following a, a, a conviction, we are very likely to see at least attempts at violence. And if our government isn't prepared for it, and if the, if the, if the media inflames it and, and uh, the, you know, with the Internet today and, 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 and what can be, uh, you know, broadcast on that and the ability to, uh, to assemble and, 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 and all those things, it just creates a... A very combustible situation. So, you know, okay. I think it's a, I think it's be a frightening time. Re Rena, we've got about a minute left. Do, do, your thoughts on that? You know, I, I think we are in an era of political violence feeling like it's the norm. But I think after January 6, 2021, uh, at least our federal level leaders have, have taken it very seriously. We know political extremism is on the rise, but there are ways to counter it. And I think also in the state houses, you see people taking it very seriously. There's so much misinformation, disinformation. It's going to get ramped up as we get towards general election day 2024. But I do see there are some really bright spots here for American democracy and a former president president, uh, who is now a private citizen by, by virtue of our, doc, our, our guiding document, the Constitution, he is being held accountable under the full weight of the law. And again, he's not been found guilty, but an indictment is an accusatory document. So let's see where this goes. But I do think it is an important day. Yesterday was a very historic and important day for democracy because it shows uh, that with justi justice, accountability has to come hand in hand. My thanks to you both, Rena Shah and Adam Kamenstein. Uh, for being part of the program today. My thanks also to Adolfo Franco, who, uh, who left us uh, halfway through. Uh, as always, uh, thank you for watching. You can see the program again at any time by going to the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us at our Facebook page. You'll find that at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And, of course, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Our